Hi everyone, I'm Steffi D. And I'm Lisa H. And welcome to Check In From Away. This week we are checking in with journalist and celebrity pop culture columnist, Shanann Gobani. Thanks for joining us. Hey Lisa, guess what? What? I hope you like gossip because today we are speaking to celebrity journalist and columnist Shanann Gavani, who knows like basically every celebrity you can possibly think of. Uh, exactly. I mean, we're going to hear about how he's chatted with Robin Williams, Joan Rivers, Madonna, and now he's chatted with us. So pretty sure we're reaching celebrity status. One degree of separation, right? Yeah. And also pretty sure that like we better watch out what we say today on the interview because like we might end up in one of his columns because we're basically celebrities now, pandemic celebrities. That's right. I mean, he did say also that his favorite celebrities to talk to are not the A-listers. So, you know, the C, D, E, F, Z listers. Hello. That's us right here. Come and get it. <laughs> Hi, I'm uh, Shanann Govani. I'm a columnist and author. Uh, I like to think of myself as a people watcher, as a pop culture decoder. Uh, I wrote a column for over a decade with the National Post. Uh, these days, I have a column at the Toronto Star. I also am a, a contributing editor to Hello Canada magazine. And I've written for a slew of other publications like Vanity Fair, Town & Country, Tatler, and The Daily Beast. <laughs> There's been a bit of a shift, but I would say I became um, most known for um, almost a daily column I used to write, uh, which involved going to parties, tracking celebrities, uh, unearthing uh, gossip, and really um, mixing it up in a kind of blender in terms of like the local scene and local socialites and visiting celebrities who were, um, you know, shooting in Toronto. Um, and then as the column got bigger and my, I guess, profile got larger, um, I started, you know, covering events and uh, celebrities at different functions around the world and, you know, started going to things like the Vanity Fair Oscar party and going to fashion weeks in Milan and Paris. And um, yeah, and, and, in looking back, um, I, you know, went to events and interviewed people um, in places as far as Dubai and Shanghai and Morocco and LA and New York more times than I can imagine. These days, I do do some of that, uh, especially during the film festival. Uh, I still, you know, go to like 40 parties a week during non-pandemic times, of course. Um, but uh, but also uh, the other hat I wear is being more of a pop culture analyst of, of sorts, like doing more commentary. Um, because I have sort of seen like the spectrum of celebrity culture really change. Like when I started writing, um, you know, about celebrities, it was like the Palm Pilot world like <laughs> not even blackberry yeah. like it was it was like that moment when like paris hilton started saying i'm you know that's hot and the <laughs> whole you know celebrity sphere sort of tilted the whole sort of temperature tilted to paris hilton and of course there was no social media and um and now i would say the vast majority of celebrity culture is uh, is about social media. It follows the currents of social media. Mm -hmm. So um, it's interesting. I do have sort of a long lens on this kind of stuff. Oh, I've always been interested in celebrities, whether it's um, reality or, or the way uh, people respond to celebrities. I think it's like an incredible prism to talk about the stuff that's important in our lives. Yeah. Like when you people even today still talk about Brangelina 
you were hearing them talk about their relationships, right. about their views on fidelity, about their views on like uh, um, feminism. Um, so yeah, that, I, I, that's how I've always approached um, like celebrity. And my pet theory, and I need to develop this a little bit more, is that the people who are not interested in celebrities are actually usually narcissists because if they're not talking about other people, they're usually talking about themselves. Like in most cases, unless you're like, you know, a nuclear physicist and really think talking about ideas. But if you eavesdrop on people in restaurants and stuff, everyone's talking about other people. And in the case of celebrities, it's just um, a heightened version of what like was happening during the age of the cavemen. Like, People in one cave were talking about the cavemen two caves over. Like, don't get it twisted. Celebrity gossip and celebrity didn't just start. Like, it's part of human nature to talk about, you know, Joe down the street. Um, or in another time, the way people talked about royalty. Yeah, you know, because those were the celebrities. Like, they talk, they they spun stories out of them. This is what Shakespeare did. This is this is all part of it. You know, so. so basically you're making like a perfect link between gossip, celebrities and then performing arts and theater and all the things, because if we do, well, it's all story. Yeah. It's all we're, we are all moved by story. Like we are fascinated by the things, the ways people want to be seen, uh, what they hunger for, uh, what they envy, how um, so much of like the early rhythms in their life, whether it's their relationship with their mom or their sister gets played out over and over again in their lives with relationships with other people. I mean, this is stuff that's so basic that I think some people don't even think about it. Right. Um, but if you sit around a dining room table during a Thanksgiving or Christmas or Diwali or whatever you celebrate and the way people talk build stories uh, out of things that happened in the past in their lives, that is performing arts. And the stories sometimes have changed or, or uh, been abridged um, over, over time because like uh, there are many different memories of one event often, yeah. right? And that's what's so fascinating about it. And I think that's what we're drawn to in terms of movies and theater as well, to see our lives reflected back to us, mm -hmm. uh, to see like interactions of people ultimately. Yeah. I'm just really surprised you weren't getting so many phone calls from me and Lisa's people when we were doing Come From Way at the Royal Alexandra Theater. I to was at the, I was at the opening. I was at the opening. Yes, I, I will never forget the opening, um, the one in Toronto, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I will. I will never forget because there is an an energy uh, at the curtain. Uh, you know, when the curtain has fallen, um, that you cannot replicate uh, with any other experience. I mean, I love. I love movies. I love uh, books, and but theater, like on opening night the rousing thunder of, of applause and people jumping you know, to their feet. Um, I knew in that moment that this was different and that this was huge. Yeah. Um, you, could, you, you could feel it. Oh yeah. Early on, and I do think about this a lot because it was, I was such a baby columnist, um, but it really helped me to get like, um, kind of a t attention even in the US. Um, I was covering the story of Tori Spelling's um, affair. Uh, she was working in Canada uh, with Dean, who now she has five children with, um, and they were both married at the time and they both left their spouses and got together. It was a huge story in the early 2000s. Now I was sort of friendly with Dean's uh, soon to be ex-wife, uh, Mary Jo Eustace, who was known in Canada, particularly in the 90s, because she had a, 
a, um, a food show for seven years. She was sort of a, a, a food personality. So um, long story short, Dean and Tori were invited to present at the Much Music Video Awards. Remember the Much Music Video Awards? They were like, yes, massive. Yes. God. Yes, it was like this huge incubator of like uh, uh, celebrity, especially I think like going going from the early 2000s in the, into the mid 2000s. So they were invited, they, they, they flew into Toronto. Um, Dean of course is from here, so has all this family and stuff. So I was going to the Much Music and Video Awards and I thought it would be fun. And this was me being a little naughty I didn't think it was going to be major drama, but I thought it would be interesting to bring Mary Jo as my date to the Much Music Video Awards. Because I had it in my mind that I would just cover the whole awards through her voice. Like I would just literally transcribe everything she said. Um, I certainly wasn't like egging her on to like have an actual confrontation or something. Um, but when we got there, and there are like 2,000 people at the Much Music Video Awards, if you recall. It was not a particularly small thing, although there was like a VIP area. Um, and I guess Tori or Tori's people got wind of the fact that Mary Jo was in the room. And at that time, like Tori Spelling was on the cover of People, Us, yeah. like Star, like, and, and her father was dying at the time, Aaron Spelling, the mega producer of you know, Charlie's Angels and 90210 and Melrose Place and Love Boat and everything. Uh, he was dying at the time and she was fighting with her mother. And it was this whole story of how much money was she going to be left. And, and then she'd left her husband for this other man. And yeah, I mean, it was a whole, it was a whole soap opera onto itself. Um, they saw that Mary Jo was there. They asked for Mary Jo and me by, uh, by virtue of the fact that I brought her as my date to be quarantined. So this is quarantine before quarantine. And we were put in a room with a TV and we watched the whole Much Music Video Awards. Like they brought us snacks and stuff, but they were like so serious about this because they wanted to make sure that eyes were on Mary Jo and that there would be no it, like interaction and we were not allowed to leave um the room until tori had left the premises but i mean i've watched all 10 plus franchises of housewives often twice in their ent entirety like i've watched atlanta for the last 12 years and it's fascinating looking back at it because you're going with new information that you know now you know that this is two husbands before. Sometimes in the case of Orange County, it's three faces before because like they've changed their looks. Like, so I love all of those shows. Um, re more recently, I've been enjoying um, uh, Shaws of Sunset, which is another Bravo show, which was so radical of its time. It doesn't even get its, its due, but it was a whole, it's on its ninth season now, but it was a whole show on television of brown people, which is like now, like all of this talk about diversity and stuff is in vogue, but we were watching these people who were all Persians on this reality show. And none of them, not all of them are likable. In fact, most of them are toxic, but I think in terms of diversity, you need to see that. You don't want to see them all just being yeah. good because that's not that's not presenting them in, in a holistic way. but. This was a whole show of brown people, half of whom are Muslim, half of whom are Jewish. The main star of it, Reza, is half Muslim, half Jewish, brown and gay. So like, tell me what films were doing, were doing that. Yeah. Tell me in the case of Atlanta, Real House of Atlanta, it's a whole cast of black women, middle age. First of all, we always talk about how like, you know, there's no place for uh, women after a certain age in, in Hollywood. These were all black divas, strong black women, like, and shading each other with like a kind of athleticism. Like even the word shade 
became popular in the pop culture because of the Real Housewives of, of, of Atlanta. People don't really know that because the word is now kind of like entered into the ecosystem. And now we live in a world where um, I always say, everybody is their own broadcaster. Everyone is their own broadsheet. Like, you know, um, because of YouTube and IG Live and, uh, and, and um, TikTok, um, you know, there are lots and lots of eyes um, in, in a very deep way on one thing. Um, but not lots and lots of eyes on a lot of things in a very broad way. So I think like is an important has shifted. I think there are more invested, more bigger fandoms in 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 niche industries than there are in terms of uh, than there is in terms of a broad audience. I think that's kind of gone. I do think about like a time I went party hopping in Toronto. It was during the Christmas season. So it was like going to a bunch of Christmas parties with Robin Williams, who is another example of someone who's gone. He was behind, he, he used to go to this particular bar in Toronto. And I think it was one of his moments where he wasn't maybe doing as well as, as he was, especially in retrospect. Because uh, you know he'd struggled with addiction, and which brought on some of his his own mental health um, troubles. But he was behind a bar, and I went to the bar, and it was like, why is Robin Williams behind this bar? And he was mixing drinks and kibitzing with <laughs> with people, like just like just like right there. Um, and apparently, he'd done this before, like because he was shooting in Toronto. And on a lark, my friend and I said well, we're going to this Christmas party. Do you want to come with us? And he hopped into the taxi with us. And I'll never forget it because it was like one of those beautiful, colorful, like leading up to December 25th nights where it's crisp, but not particularly cold. And the, the, in the taxi, there were uh, Christmas carols playing. And Robin said, turn them up. Uh, and then the driver turned up, turned up the carols. And then we just sang Christmas carols. My one friend, Robin Williams and I um, going to this party and this party was kind of far. It was sort of on the East end and we were coming from the West end. Um, and then we went to this party and everyone was like, oh my God, Robin Williams. So he kind of like did the rounds there and there was a live band going on and he got up on the, he got up on the live band and then like, 20 minutes later, next party. So we went into a taxi and then we went to the Windsor Arms where there was this other shishi party. And then Robin realized he left his coat at the other party. So we were on the phone trying to get his coat and so we had to go back. And I mean, it was just a whole, it was a whole thing. My take is that um, the pendulum always swings, so we will we will see it swing big time, like much like how uh, the Gatsby era came out of uh, uh, you know the Great Depression. Um, you, you people are more acutely aware of um, the power of human connection, and people will want to be out and connecting. Um, in a huge way. I do think that um, people do say this, but I, I, but I also, on the other hand, do think that um, that is overstated as well, because I think that one thing uh, I do know as someone who reads a lot of like social history and, and um, is just aware of sort of like uh, different shifts in, in pop culture is that human beings are infinitely capable of mass amnesia. And I can, I can see how like a year from now, like after they've tuckered themselves out from socializing <laughs> and connecting, that we'll all be back to complaining about, oh, have to dress up and go out again. I mean, human beings are a bundle of contradictions and I don't think that the pandemic is going to make us more virtuous uh, in the long run. 
no way. I mean, I think if you know anything, like you, all you have to do is go back as recently as 9-11. People think every, everything would change after 9-11. They said that irony was dead. They said that um, celebrity culture didn't matter. And then, you know, it was only a few years later where like, you know, the mass celebrity culture of TMZ and Perez Hilton, uh, you know, was born. Yeah. So I think everything is a moment in time. Um, but of course, I, I, I do think that we have been reminded collectively of if we if we if we took it for granted before, uh, we're going to probably take it uh, less for granted now. I think like a lot of people, um, as we've all exhaled during this time, you, I think most of us hopefully have taken this time to really think about our, the span of our lives and what makes us who we are. And for me, um, I've been thinking a lot about stuff I pushed away for a while in that I actually started my life as a refugee. I came to Canada uh, with a family of refugees, i.e. I was born into a world where I had no country, I had no citizenship, and my parents had to come to Canada with literally nothing and have handouts and try to build a life in a country where they didn't know the language or, or the weather. And um, so when I think about like what my father and mother had to endure and I'm being asked to sit on a couch. Yeah. Even if I catch myself complaining about like not being able to go to a restaurant, which I do love, like one of my favorite things is like going to a restaurant by myself and just like feeling the white noise. I got into the ro those rooms, but I got into it on my, on my own terms. Yeah. Right. And so it doesn't matter like how famous, how powerful, how rich someone else is. Like I feel comfortable just talking to them because we're all people at the end of the day, we all have stories. Yeah. Um, and, and even those people who seem like they have everything, who have no problems, like you don't know what, you know what, you don't know what dark stuff they're, they're dealing with, like, right? Thanks for joining us on this week's episode of Check In From Away. Happy summer holiday. Cheers. We've got some hot gossip that's fresh off the presses. That's right. Steffi and I are taking a summer vacation. We're taking about a month off, but then we will be back with some more hot Check In From Away content. Thank you so much for watching up until this point. We love you. We'll see you soon. Enjoy the sun. Cheers. Cheers.